Hi, welcome to Doris Grows Up. That was the original name of my CD Grown Up. When I first decided to make it, it was a, a record that I was going to make for my fans because I'd gotten so much fan mail over the years asking me if I was ever going to make a record. I figured it was time. Ultimately, when Grown Up was done, we felt it was a, a more rounded uh, record that reflected both my life on fame and my life now. I hope you enjoy the talk and I hope you enjoy the music. When I wrote Never Never, it was in response to my friend David Graff's death. It's a friend of mine who was an actor who had died instantly, you know, in the middle of a beautiful wedding with his family and had hit the ground in the middle of his whole family and, and died on the spot. And you know, like 3,000 people showed up to this guy's funeral. He was the nicest man in the world, and I couldn't reconcile it on any level, and I'd been kind of playing with this tune, and, um, and the song just literally poured right out and almost wrote itself, and so that's always for me the song for David and, and for reconciling the irreconcilable, and I was actually asked to sing at a big gathering uh, on September 16th, after right after uh, September 11th, and, and that was the song that I sang. Fly Home is the second song I ever wrote on guitar, and I wrote it in uh, 1985, and I wrote it for James. It was after he'd written me countless songs, I, <laughs> I finally wrote him a song. And, you know, and it was very funny because it always to me sounded like a country song, which was not music that I particularly liked. And I'm, I really like the version of it that's on the record. I like the song the way it kind of grew up. It's a special kind of morning and the fights start without warning Cause I'm leaving on an airplane and you just can't bear the thought of being Too damn far to kiss me, but you're far enough to miss me Got a two-way destination which means all my printed paper is round trip And I fly home There's a river running through me. I was on a women's retreat, and everything that we were talking about had to do with women and women's lives and the, the, the blood running through us. And River really came out of that weekend. And River, another song that wrote itself. I was sitting in the sun, I had the guitar, I was under a tree, and, and the lyrics just came out with River. I really had no sense that, that I was really writing what was like a jazz-like song and, and no sense of, of that it would become you know, that kind of song on the record. Uh, and that was really the first song that came out of the, of the original songs that are on the record. I asked my friend John, um, who was doing a lot of research and study uh, around the historical aspects of Jesus and I said to him you know what's what's really the historical take and he and, you know, sort of we started to talk about that and and he said well the historical take is that he, he's a guy with brothers and sisters and his parents think he's a little nuts and he's you know really talking about things that most people aren't uh, agreeing with and, uh, and he has this very interesting following he kind of keeps to himself and and I said to John at the time, it's, you know, he really sounds like all my ex-boyfriends. And that's really the beginning of where that song came out of. And for me, it was one of the most complicated songs I'd written. And I really enlisted the help of my husband. And for the longest time, I almost couldn't even play it. I had written it, but couldn't play it. And, uh, and I think for me, it's, 
it's probably my favorite song on the album. self-bulletproof for the world and then finding a place that, that I didn't, didn't need to make myself bulletproof in that way. Love Song is, a, is the, probably the only cover that Elton John ever recorded. And I, you know, I love this song and, and it was one of the few songs that when I used to sing with James I would sing you know that song and so I got really good at that song and, and when it came down to, to recording it on the album uh, I had to go to kind of any length to get um, clearance to be able to, to change it in certain ways and do what I was doing with it and there's a great you know choir of friends on that song and, and one of the people you know in that choir of voices is a, a wonderful actor named Bill Fagerbachy who is the voice of Patrick the Starfish on Spongebob Squarepants and and you know so it's just nice it's, I'm, I feel I'm very surrounded by my friends in that song and, and I'm just like wrapped in the warmth of my husband James's guitar. Wait For You is a Greg Hilfman Phil Roy song that I used in a movie that I was directing and I just always loved this song and I always wanted to sing it. And you know, ultimately when I hear it on the on the on the record, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how well I did with it, but you know it was it was a it was a chance for me to risk and stretch and try and do something that I wasn't sure I could do. And I'm glad I did it. High Fidelity. I knew that I could not have the original version of High Fidelity because I would listen to it and I would think there's nothing, there just couldn't be anything more terrible than somebody, you know, 43 years old, like jumping around and singing this song. And and I talked to Lee about it. We were coming back from, from a publicity uh, thing when they started airing the show in, in London. And we, he had his computer with him and we just started to play around with the idea of doing an updated version and that's really what this became and it was really a labor of love to do it with Lee and uh, nice to just be sitting in the studio with him and creating it. I wanted to write a rock and roll song. I wanted to write like a Beatles or Bamba rock and roll song and and girls became that and, and somewhere in the middle of that I decided that I would also um, I would say I wanted to sing, I don't, I'm not sure why I decided I wanted to sing one uh, verse in Spanish, but it just seemed along sort of the La Bamba lines, the thing to do, and it sounded so great, and I enlisted the, the help of my friend Douglas Clegg, who translated it for me, and, uh, and then I had to learn Spanish because I didn't speak Spanish, so I had to learn enough to be able to make that sound right, and, uh, and, and, I, and I did love, you know, when I would play it in gigs, my, it was the most fun to be able to like get out my electric guitar and play that song. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Endless Sea of all the songs uh, that I've written is the only song where literally I wrote the lyrics out and I, I maybe changed a word 
or two. It, I wrote these lyrics out and they, they just stood on the paper. The song just poured out of me in about an hour and a half. And, and the lyrics remained unchanged, and it was really talking about, I was, I was having a very difficult time uh, working through an emotional situation, and it was the first time that I experienced something that my husband had talked about, which was really having your music heal you, really making a passage via something you were creating. And by the time that song was written and I could sing it out loud and I remember sitting in my parents house and singing this song out loud and thinking feeling that part that had been so tight and, and frightened around what I was going through open up and, and really remain open and it was really an incredible experience I put uh, Never Unplugged at the end of the album because uh, my great friends, uh, Trish and George Fradenberg, who really provided so much support in so many ways for this album, both emotionally and financially. They had heard the song when I had just finished writing it, and I played it for them. And they, they just loved the way it sounded with just guitar. And, there's, and, and really, the produced version is really the way that I always wanted to hear it. And so I, I like it both ways, and that's why I, I bookended the uh, record with it. <laughs> 